Thank you for okay. that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I am Ann Campbell, and I'm going to talk today about cognitive complexity. Um, now, I feel the need to start this presentation with a discussion of why at Sonar Source we felt the need to add yet another code complexity metric to the world. Um, the story starts with our initial in implementation of cyclomatic complexity as a rule. Um, in the rule description, we relied on Thomas McCabe's uh, wording from his original paper, which described cyclomatic complexity as a way of measuring the testability and maintainability of the maintainability of a module of code. And we um, transformed that in the rule description to uh, telling you that a method with high cyclomatic complexity would be difficult to understand and therefore to maintain. Now, the problem with this was that a method that consists solely of a switch with a large number of cases is going to have a high cyclomatic complexity because of the way cyclomatic complexity works. And so as a programmer, when I'm looking at this issue and it's telling me that this method is going to be difficult to understand and maintain, the typical programmer response to that is bullshit because switches are easy. A switch tests a single variable against a preset static list of values, and that's simply not difficult to understand. Um, the next problem that we had with cyclomatic complexity was in our initial implementation. Someone, and I'm honestly don't know who, um, had the bright idea in this implementation to combine both cyclomatic complexity and essential complexity and call it cyclomatic complexity. And so we were incrementing not just for everything that cyclomatic complexity should increment for, in, including every case in a switch, but also for extra returns. And so people were calling bullshit on that as well, you know, reasonably. Um, and then we had, and, and so we thought, okay, well, well, let's fix it. We can fix the implementation. We'll, we'll stop inc incrementing for the extra returns. Um, but we still had more problems. Um, the first was that cyclomatic complexity wasn't written with modern constructs in mind. It was written in 19, it was published in 1976 um, and in a co COBOL context. And so it didn't explicitly address things like try catch, lambdas, um, that sort of thing. And so, you know, how do we deal with that? But the other part was that we still needed something that gets at understandability and cyclomatic complexity just doesn't. As an illustration of that, I've got a couple of um, methods that I've lifted straight from the white paper that you'll find on the Sonar Source website. So the first here is sum of primes. Um, and cyclomatic complexity, we're going to increment once for the method structure itself, um, once for each four, once for the if, and that gives us a total cyclomatic complexity of four. Contrast that with this other method, method which consists solely of a switch with three cases and a default. Again, we increment for the method structure itself and once for each of the cases for an equal cyclomatic complexity of four. So while these methods have equal cyclomatic complexity, I think it's obvious that they don't have equal understandability. Um, and so we said, we need something new. Um, what do we base it on though? Because math won't work. Math gives us incrementing for each case in a switch statement. So after thinking about this, talking about it for several months, we came up with some guiding principles. The first guiding principle is to ignore structures that allow multiple statements to be readably shorthanded into one. Now, what's behind this is the old saw that if you can measure it, you can improve it. So we were painfully aware that if we measured it, someone would think that it should be improved and that anything we incremented for was going to be a candidate for being factored out. And so what we didn't want to do was incent the wrong behavior. We didn't want to incent someone to get rid of structures that readably shorthand multiple statements into one. So what do I mean by that? First of all, the method structure itself. If I increment for the method structure, that might incent someone to turn all of the code in a class into one giant method and drop the class value overall. So we're not going to do that. Um, we also don't increment for 
things like null coalescing operators, because once you understand that syntax, then you take what starts as uh, variable assignment, variable test, variable reassignment, and you can, struct, you can short the hand that into one single statement, and it's super readable um, once you understand the syntax, and we don't want to incent people to roll that back. So that's why we ignore readable shorthand statements. Now, what we don't ignore um, is breaks in the linear flow of the code. And what's behind this is the thought that ideally, I would be able to read the code like I read a novel, left to right, top to bottom in an unbroken flow. When we hit things that break that flow, that makes me think harder. And so we're gonna increment for that. Um, and finally, we're gonna increment when flow breaking structures are nested. This will become more obvious momentarily. So specifically um, for, for principle two, what we increment for is if, else, if, else, ternary. Now we do get a slight discount here on ternary because a ternary is an if and an else together and we only increment one for both of them. Um, I had a discussion on Twitter recently with someone who thought that we ought to ignore it like a null coalescing operator. And I will argue all day with you that ternary is not readable shorthand. So moving on, we also increment once for a switch in all its cases, no matter how many there are. We increment for four for each while, do while. We increment for catch, not the try, but the catch. Try does not change the flow of the code. The flow only changes when you hit the catch. We increment for go to, break to a label, continue to a label, and analogous structures. I discovered last week that PHP has a structure where you can break it to an integer, and that integer tells you how many levels to break out of. That's not exactly a break to a label, um, but it's analogous, and so we treat it the same. We increment for sequences of binary logical operators. And the thinking here is that A and B is, is easy. It, it does take some thoughts. We're gonna increment for that. But once you've incremented for A and B, A and B and C is not that much harder. A and B and C and D, no big deal. Um, and the same for A or B or C or D. When it gets hard is when you say A or B and C or D, that makes you think really hard. And so we're gonna increment each time the operator changes, each time the sequence restarts. We also increment for each method in a recursion cycle, and there are two reasons we increment for recursion. One is that recursion is a loop, and we increment for loops. And the other is that I have seen seasoned programmers blanch at the thought of dealing with recursion, which tells me recursion is hard, and so we need to take that into account. Now, in terms of nesting, um, these, this on the left, are, it, these on the left are the structures that we increment the nesting level for. So if, else, if, else, ternary, switch, for, for each, while, do, while, catch, and nested methods and method-like structures such as lambdas. So we don't increment for the method itself, but once you start nesting method inside of method inside of method, that is going to notch up the nesting level. Now, these are the things that receive a nesting increment. So if I have an if inside of an if, then the if gets its own increment plus a nesting level increment. Same for the ternary switch, the loops, the catch. This will become clearer when we start looking at code. There are exceptions and they are all language specific. For instance, COBOL does not have an else if structure. I'm very sad for COBOL programmers. That does not mean that they don't need to do an else if. And so in COBOL, what you end up doing is if and an else, and then inside that else, nothing. you have another if with an else, and inside that else is another if, and so on. We're not gonna penalize COBOL because they're using a language that doesn't have all the features modern languages do. So when it's structured the way we, as though it were an else if, then we don't, increment, we don't penalize for that. Similarly, up until a few years ago, Java didn't, JavaScript, excuse me, did not have the class structure. Um, and so we're not gonna penalize JavaScript developers for uh, working in a language that has a lot of legacy code where you have a function standing in as an ad hoc class structure. 
Um, and, and my understanding is not only is there a lot of legacy code still out there that's structured like that, but there are a lot of uh, currently still popular frameworks that require you to write that way. So we're not going to penalize the JavaScript developers for that. Similarly, we're not going to penalize Python developers for decorators. We do add exceptions as we become aware of features in a language. So um, th these are all the exceptions that we have so far, but the list is not necessarily closed. So coming back to my example code, um, again, this method has a cyclomatic complexity of four, but if we look at it in terms of cognitive complexity, on that first four, we have an increment of one for the four. Inside of that is another four, and that gets a plus two. That's one for the four itself and one for the nesting level. Inside that is an if, and so that's plus three, one for the if, two for the nesting. Then we have a continue to a label. Now continue is not something that receives the nesting increment, so we increment only for the continue itself. And that gives us a total cognitive complexity of this method of seven. Contrast that with get words, which again consists of a switch with a few cases and a default. And we increment once for a switch in all its cases. And so get words has a cognitive complexity of one. And so now you can start to look at the numbers, purely the numbers and understand which of these two methods is gonna be more difficult to understand. And it's worth pointing out at this point that if I had a method that, with, that didn't have any structure in it, it's just um, variable declaration, variable assignment, and um, calling methods, that method would have a cognitive complexity of zero, and that's perfectly normal and expected. So there are some things that are not included in cognitive complexity, um, and they're not included because whether or not they're hard is super subjective. So for instance, uh, in C, pointer indirection, one level of pointer indirection is an everyday thing, two levels of pointer indirection, yeah, no big deal. Three levels, it starts to get hard, four levels, when do you start counting? Um, the same thing with templates and generics in Java and C-sharp. Um, you know, some people think that generics are, are hard just to start with. Some people think generics don't get hard until you're two or three levels in. Multiple inheritance synchronization. All the things that are language-specific features um, that would turn into holy wars if we tried to say, this is where it starts getting hard or this language feature is hard. Those things are subjective, and so we left them out. We said, okay, we're, we're going to keep it just about structure that goes across languages, and it's easy, easily quantifiable. So I guess what I'm saying here is that cognitive complexity is not a wholly encompassing measure of understandability, but it's about it's, it will measure the understandability of your structure. Now, um, it might be ironic to some people that I'm leaving some things out because they're subjective, because you could say that the whole thing is subjective. Um, you know, cognitive complexity was crafted uh, by me and my colleagues, um, seasoned developers with a good intuition about what makes code hard to understand. Um, but to some degree, it was just subjective until this summer uh, when a paper was published um, by these three researchers who undertook to to examine whether or not cognitive complexity is a good measure of source code understandability you've got the um, url to the paper there on the screen and i think it's being shared in the chat as well right now um, so what they did was a survey study. So they looked at a number of other studies that were already published, um, studies that looked at understandability of code. And for the studies that published the code that they used, um, these researchers calculated the cognitive complexity of that study, and then they indexed it to the measured understandability of those original researchers. And in doing so, what they found much to my delight and relief, was that cognitive complexity is a good indicator of how long it takes developers to understand a piece of code. 
Um, and code snippets with higher cognitive complexity are also rated as more difficult to understand. Now, it's worth pointing out here, this is a direct quote from the paper, but the emphasis is mine. They didn't use bold. Um, they also found that snippets with a high cognitive complexity are worth refactoring. Um, the metric can help you find sections of code that should be refactored or could be refactored for a better understandability. What they did not find is what a good threshold is for cognitive complexity. Um, and, and that's a bit of an interesting story because when we initially started implementing cognitive complexity as a rule, we started with Java and we started with Thomas McCabe's uh, recommended threshold of 10. In his original paper, um, Thomas McCabe recommended a threshold of 10 uh, cyclomatic complexity points in a module. And so we started with that. And as we tested the rule against large swaths of existing code, what we found was that was too low. And so we tuned it up to 15, um, and that's the limit in most languages. Now, when the C family developers implemented cognitive complexity as a rule for C, uh, C++, and Objective-C, what they came to was that if you program in C, C++, you have a higher tolerance for complexity. Um, that setting a threshold of 15 would raise far too many issues on existing code. And so they tuned the threshold for those rules, those languages, to 25. Um, perhaps these three researchers will come back to us next year or in a year or two with a new study that tells us maybe empirically what the threshold ought to be. Um, but that's where it is today. So now, to me, it's not super useful to, to point at something and say, that's not good, unless you can do something about it. And so what I want to move on to now is refactoring with cognitive complexity. So how do I use my cognitive complexity score to make my code better? Um, in looking at large volumes of code um, to extract different ways to refactor with cognitive complexity, I've come up with basically four types of things you can do. So first is invert a condition and do an early return. Um, that can drop a lot of nesting points um, and drop your score dramatically in some cases. The next is to extract another method. So um, extract a chunk of code from the middle of a very large method into a new readably named method. Um, so that your original method is easier to read. Alternately, if you're doing the same operation multiple times, um, then extracting a helper method can be super useful. Um, next is what I've hopefully memorably called structural collapse. This is not what happens in an earthquake. Um, this is just a memorable way of saying when you have an if that contains nothing but another if that contains nothing but another if, collapse those into one if statement, anding the conditions together, and you save yourself a lot of nesting and make the whole thing easier to read. Um, and finally, language features. So if, for instance, you're in a language that has a null coalescing operator, um, being aware of that and recognizing when you can apply that can be super helpful. So um, I want to I'm, in a minute, I'm going to jump into the IDE and start looking at some refactoring. But I want to start by giving you uh, a, a good example of structural collapse, which is this method. Um, and I, I, I have to assume that this developer had just come straight from COBOL into Java. Um, in COBOL, there would be a discount for this because you don't have the ELSIF structure, but we're in Java here, and ELSIF is available, and so you don't get a discount. And so in this fairly short method, we've got a cognitive complexity of 57. Um, and if we look at this, we've got an if with an else, and there's nothing inside the else but another if with an else, and so on. And so if we were to collapse this into a single if ELSIF tree, um, we would drop from 57 to I counted this up yesterday, and I think it's like 13 total um, with these ORs that also get counted. Um, it, at any rate, I know you end up below the threshold if you just collapse this in, into a single if else if tree. Um, so that, to be really explicit, is what I mean when I'm talking about structural collapse. 
So now I'm going to jump into the IDE. Um, there we go. Um, there we go. And look at some cognitive complexity issues in some existing code. Now, just for background, um, I'm in IntelliJ IDEA, and here at the bottom, I've got my Sonar Lint pane open. Sonar Lint is one of the three products offered by Sonar Source. Sonar Lint is a free IDE plugin. It's available for Sonar Lint. Excuse me. It's available for IntelliJ IDEA. It's available for Eclipse. It's available for Visual Studio and VS Code. Um, you can get these from your uh, plugin centers or um, extension centers. Um, just plug it in and go. It's free to use always. So um, now I've got in this file several cognitive complexity issues. I'm not going to treat all of the ones in this file. I'm going to start with this, the highest one here, 45. So when I click on the issue, it takes me to that location in the file. I went ahead and pre-scrolled so you didn't actually see that happen. Um, but the other thing it does is gives me access to the rule description, which I'm not going to linger on because I think we're all familiar with it at this point. But it also shows me the locations, if there are any, that contribute to the issue. And so down here at the bottom left, um, I can see I've got some plus ones. So this is top level, no nesting. Got a little bit of nesting here. And then I come all the way down here to this plus eight. So I've got an if statement that's nested seven levels. So when I'm first assessing a method for how to decrease cognitive complexity, um, I, I look to see where it comes from. So does it come from a lot of nesting? Do I have a big pyramid like I do in this particular method? Or do I have lots of little pyramids like with this two nested ifs? Or do I just have a lot of top level complexity. So here I've got a nice pyramid shape and so I'm going to look a little bit more closely at that and if I look at the very center of it I see that I have an if statement which is the only thing inside another if statement which is the only thing inside another if statement. And so this is um, a candidate for structural collapse and doing that would drop, I think this one was plus seven, so it would drop 15 for these two ifs in their nesting. It is going to introduce a sequence of binary logical operators, so that's plus one, but I'll take that trade off. The other thing I'm going to look at is, okay, can I reduce this at the top level? So I'm going to look at this outer if and see what else is in it and where the method ends. And I see that um, after this if ends, there's not much left in the method. So this is a candidate for an early return, an inverted condition in an early return. Now, rather than make you guys watch me type, um, I decided to do this cooking show style. Um, so this is on the left is what it looks like going into the oven. And here on the right is what it looks like coming back out of the oven. And so you'll see that I didn't do anything with these top two ifs. It's a total of three points. It's not a huge deal. I, I was, you know, it's a little tempting to try and collapse these two if statements, but I've got something in between um, and it would change the meaning if I were to move the location of this logging statement. So I left that alone. Um, but I did do my inverted condition and early return. And so that dropped multiple nesting points on the rest of this code. The other thing I did was collapse my three ifs. Um, so now it's very clear that all three of these conditions are met. And then I do this. But that doesn't get me below the threshold. That gets me down to 25. Um, that's, that's the issue that I'm looking at here. And so I kept looking. And I realized that this if statement here is a really good candidate to be extracted to a new method. And so I thought I would actually do that on camera since IntelliJ is really cool and how easy it makes this. So it even suggests a really nice name for this. So if I do this refactoring, okay, and it's not gonna prompt me, and I should see there. So I don't know if you guys noticed it, but my my cognitive complexity issue with a count of 25 went away. So that got me below the threshold. Sonar Lint, um, after the change, 
reassessed the issues in the file and dropped that issue from the list for me automatically. And so now, if I do the before and after, here's my before on the left. And my after on the right, um, I think it's quite arguable that the new version on the right is easier to read. Um, and so there's that one. So I'm going to move on now to the next example that I had for you. Now, those of you who are familiar with IntelliJ recognize that the red underline on this file name means that there's a compile error. I swear to you, this is not my compile error. This is how I loaded the file. Um, there are some extra throws that, that are, aren't needed in some overrides. Um, but I did not clean those up just because I didn't want to touch the file too much. So what I want to talk about here is the single cognitive complexity issue where we've got 23 versus the 15 allowed. And so if I look at the locations, I see that I've got mostly top level complexity. I've got a series of plus twos here. And so if I scroll through the code to take a look at those, um, there we go. So I've got a top level if, and then inside that, I've nested a series of ifs. And then I come out of that and I go into a series of else ifs. If I look back at my nested ifs, what I notice is that in each one, I'm testing the same variable against a static set of values. Now that sounds a lot like a switch. Um, and in Java, since Java 7, you have the ability to switch on a string. And so th that's what I did. This is where language features come in, knowing what you can do in your language. So I know that in Java, I can turn this into a switch. And so that's what I did over here. Now, admittedly, what you're seeing on the right is refactored uh, a little bit further than cognitive complexity alone would have led me to do. As I started working in this code, Sonar Lint was raising new issues on it, and it prompted me to go a little bit further. And so I was able to boil this down into something that's really tight and, and I think highly readable, highly understandable. Um, I looked at this series of LSIFs to see if I could boil that down any as well. Um, and without changing the underlying code uh, to say, give me a way to um, switch across um, the names of the uh, exception types that we're looking at, um, I can't. Um, and so while it was tempting to go a little bit further with this, um, I, I didn't want to go too far. The change that I've made here, turning those nested ifs into a single nested switch, already does get me below the threshold. And so I decided that was good enough and I stopped. Now, the final one I want to show you is here. So we've got two JSON string. If I look at where the complexity is coming from, I've got some top level complexity with my plus ones and twos here. And then I get into some nesting where I get up to plus four. So, okay, let's look at the code itself. And what I see here is I've got, got a, an initial if with a nested for. It's probably not a lot I can do with that unless I want to extract that to another method. That's an option. Um, I've got an if here. Let's see. Okay, so there's not a lot that happens in the method after this if. So that's a super good candidate for an inverted condition and an early return. Um, and in fact, that's what I did here. So I invert the condition and I do an early return and that dropped the nesting level of the stuff inside it uh, a good bit, but it didn't quite get me below the threshold. And so I looked a little bit further and what I noticed was with my, so this is the one where I'm plus four. I've got this if count less than size minus one, add a comma. And I do something almost exactly the same here if a count is less than a size minus one, add a comma. So I've got a repeated operation here. And I said, okay, this is a good candidate 
to extract to a helper method. Um, and so I, I squinted at this a little bit longer and I realized that what we're doing here is, let me find my comment, add a comma if we're not dealing with the last entry. And so by extracting this helper method, um, not only did I drop, I think it was five points of complexity to get me below the threshold, but I, I obviously, at least to me, made this method easier to read. So those were the refactoring examples that I had for y'all. Um, I'm going to flip back to my slides here real quick to say, oh, yeah, I was supposed to show you this before I started refactoring, but we've done it already. Um, and at this point, I'm ready to take questions if you guys have any. Yes, indeed, there is some question. So uh, the first one is uh, what about co cognitive complexity with functional programming when we start to pipe uh, too many functions? Is there anything to measure it? Uh, so I'll be quite honest with you and tell you that um, it's been a while since I've looked at what functional uh, programming actually is, and so I would have to act I would have to do some research before I could even okay. answer the question. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, is the cognitive complexity engine uh, implementation different between a static language language or dynamic language? I. Can you give me uh, an example? Tariq, can you write something in the chat to precise uh, your question? Because it, I, JavaScript on Java. Ah, no, not at all, because the, the structures are the same. You know, you, you have the same ideas from language to language, whether or not it's compiled or interpreted. Okay. Uh, another question, are all nested, nested linear or do uh, yes or do they become exponential after a certain threshold that's really tempting but no it's linear <laughs> <laughs> okay um, what other metrics sonarlint use besides cognitive complexity so uh, that's an interesting question sonarlint doesn't actually do metrics sonarlint does rules and so the question would actually be what rules are available in sonarlint that are against metrics um, and offhand i think the answer is only going to be cyclomatic complexity there are other metric based rules available in sonar cube and sonar cloud but those are computed server side um, not and this is a technical detail, but because they're computed ser server side, they're not available in Sonar Lint. Okay. Um, another question: To what point is to what point is cognitive complexity better accepted by developers compared to other measures of quality to conv con convince them to change the way they code? That's a really interesting question. Um, so I, 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 I hope I've adequately demonstrated that um, cyclomatic complexity is not necessarily accepted by developers as a, as a prod to refactoring. Um, you know, I did, when I did the initial research on this in 2016, I did look at a lot of other complexity metrics. And what I found was that most of them simply didn't have the uptake. Um, and so what I have found since we introduced this in 2016, and, and perhaps should have mentioned before, is that um, a number of tools, in addition to Sonar Cube, Sonar Cloud, uh, and therefore Sonar Lint, have implemented cognitive complexity. Um, it, it seems to just resonate with people. Um, the, for the same way that within Sonar Source, we said, okay, this makes sense to us. Let's let's write it up and put it out there. Other developers seem to look at this and go, yeah, this makes sense. Um, but in terms of um, you know 
metrics in terms of uptake. I really can't give you that. I did, I did do a survey of issues on um, Sonar Cloud a few years ago, looking at, um, so I was looking at cognitive complexity issues in open source projects, trying to um, measure developer acceptance. And, and what I used as a metric, as a, as a measure of that was um, how many issues are being um, fixed or accepted versus how many issues are being closed, won't fix or, or false positive. And when I looked at the numbers on that, um, what I found is that people generally accepted it. Um, but I don't think I can give you anything more concrete than that. I hope that yes. helps. Just, uh, well, thank you. Um, did you think uh, about measuring some complex language uh, feature uh, uh, as, a, as complex code? For, uh, in the opposite way, you decide to not measure some things in the language. For example, in JavaScript, so you, you say that you don't measure the, the classes. But uh, sometimes in, in, uh, in some languages, like JavaScript uh, 2, there is some some things that is not very easy to understand at first. For example, uh, if I take the generator, uh, few people understand the generator. So did you have, did you measure the, the natural complex uh, feature of, uh, of language? And, and so again, this is something that we did consider. We did talk about it um, and we decided just not to go there because um, for some people, the generator is going to be difficult. For other people, it's going to be easy. Um, and for, for for me, who I have coded in JavaScript, but it's not it's not where I've lived. Um, for me to come in and say, okay, that's hard. We're going to increment for it um, is difficult. It's difficult for me to justify. Um, just like I, I was talking about pointer and direction. If you're a Java developer coming in to see, you're going to look at one level of pointer and direction and go, whoa, that's hard. Versus uh, someone who's used to working in C is going to go, one star is not a problem, go away. Um, and so that's why we kept it to just structure and said, we're not going to include any kind of language specific mm -hmm. okay. features. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I think I will reward the last question. <laughs> Um, is there any the, any other tools to measure uh, the the complexity of code uh, that you know that is not doing the the job you, the same job that that uh, Sonar is doing? Uh, the... uh, well, there are a number of other metrics um, that that have been proposed since 1976 um, and the real question would be um, finding someone who actually implements those metrics um, and I'm not really aware you know so there are one-off tools here and there to measure a specific other complexity metric for this language or you know this other metric for this language um, there's not something that offers uh, a given metric across a broad array of languages like we do in Sonar Cube and Sonar, Sonar Cloud, Sonar Lint. Um, and I, and I, I'm kind of speculating here when I say this, but um, I would guess that that's because there just hasn't been the interest in the uptake of those other metrics to prompt someone to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, is someone else have uh, any question or uh, not? Because for the moment, I, I think we have finished with the Q&A. 10 seconds to write the question. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. OK, we're done. <laughs> Ah, yes, last question. Is there is other researches? Uh, Tariq, can you please precise your question? I'm not sure to understand. Hmm. Uh, 
so uh, okay is there other researches about the complexity okay uh, like you like we you exposed so the the first one you told about um, the, the one the one researches uh, you, you told about that was published in July so uh, I'm not aware of any other academic studies of cognitive complexity there is if you search diligently on the internet you'll find um, something I wrote up uh, and submitted to uh, an academic conference a few years ago about that study of developer acceptance that I did or survey on uh, sonar cloud um, but there's no, no other paper that's not come out of sonar source other that I'm aware of other than the one that I mentioned today okay thank you so i think we have finished with the question uh a big thank you to you uh anna uh if people were too shy to ask a question now uh we will just stay five or ten minutes ah, new question what will be the future of sonar ia ia uh, enhanced measure do you think that we will go to um, intelligence artificial uh, artificial intelligence uh, for the measure uh so i'm not on that side of it anymore um i i think we've we looked a couple of years ago at ai um and i i don't think we got anywhere useful i'm not saying that we won't do that again i'm not aware of of movement in that direction right now um, our, our current focus is on adding SAST analysis in SonarCube and SonarCloud. And in fact, we just did a, an announcement today, um, and I won't hijack this to talk about it, um, but SAS analysis, uh, injection detection, TAIN analysis is our current function uh, focus uh, and where we're putting most of our effort. Okay. Thank you. So, um, as I am saying in the chat, we will go now again in a little bit network mode. So, if you want, uh, you can ask uh, your question directly to, to Anne on the, on the table. So, thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. And uh, so, I will stop the broadcast now and we will go again in uh, five or ten minutes again in um, network mode and and before you uh before you stop the broadcast i just want to say two things one thank you very much for having me and giving me a chance to talk about my baby um and second is i meant to update this last slide to say not at sonar source but at gn camp so if you want to ping me directly you can reach me on twitter at g a n n c a m i will give, I will give you a twitter on, uh, on the chat it will be easier for people. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Bye, y'all.